It is good to be here tonight. Good to see you. We're going to get to Daniel chapter 4. If you want to be opening your Bibles there, it'll be just momentarily there. But, uh, but if you want to go ahead and be finding that place, we'll be headed that direction. I'm in Job 23. Maybe somebody's got the answer. You ready, young people? What kind of person does Job think could reason with God? The upright. Very good, very good. The upright. As Job's making his case there in Job 23, he, he's, he's basically saying, listen, if, if, if you and I are living like we ought to be living, then, then there's nothing wrong with us questioning God. That, that the upright, the godly, have a, have, a, have a reason, have an opportunity to discuss with God. And, and, and God, is not, God is not undermined. God is not upset. God is willing to listen, and and so thus, that's the gist of chapter 23. In chapter 24, Job says that the soul of the wounded do what? Cry out. out. Cry out. They must have went from handing out gummy bears to handing out McDonald's hamburgers. Because, boy, this road's gotten into, I don't know what the treats are now, but this road's really picked it up. Maybe it's something better than a McDonald's hamburger. I don't know. Job 26, where does God bind up the waters? Thick clouds. I heard it somewhere back there. Good job. Thick clouds. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Even if you hadn't studied the book of Job, obviously we understand the rain cycle, and Job understood the rain cycle as well. In the 27th chapter, where, who will, excuse me, who will lie down and not be gathered up? The wealthy, the rich man. Obviously, in chapter 27, as it were there, the point is being made on the priorities of life and what is most important and how you can have great riches and and you can be wealthy and and you can have all this world has to offer, but but there comes a time when those riches aren't going to provide uh, you the satisfaction, the joy, the reward that, that the soul desires. And so that point is made very clear in chapter 27 in a contrast there in the book of Job. Our word for tonight is humility. i got to be honest with you. I started Monday on this lesson. I just just knew without a doubt it's going to be the best lesson I'd ever preached. I mean, after all, I'm a great preacher. I knew that going into Monday, right? And I just knew when I come across this word, I thought, man, I got that mastered, you know. I know what being humble is. I can be humble without any practice at all. As a matter of fact, I went into an elders meeting Friday, Monday night, and I told them that, just about verbatim. Well, since then, I've lost four nights of sleep, and I've gained a fever and something going on in my body, and the Lord says, I'll humble you, big boy. I'll show you how well you can preach. Isn't it amazing in life how... How humility works. It, it is easy, isn't it? Doing a little tongue-in-cheek there. It is easy sometimes to elevate ourselves higher than we ought to be elevated. And Peter reminds us that God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the, to the humble. And when you look at the word humility, it's about, trans, it's about being humble and transferring that from I to you. In other words, in Philippians chapter 2, the Bible says, don't look out for your own interest, but look out for the interest of, of others. So when you think about the word humility, being humble in mind, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7, the Bible says, Jesus had this mind, and, he, and, and Paul wanted us to have the same mind. What is that mind? Well, he humbled himself, and he became nothing, being born in the Likeness of man. He didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. He had every right to elevate himself and, and, and to, to, to exercise his position as part of the Godhead. But he, he lowered himself. He stooped down, if you will. He emptied himself. He poured out. He let go of. And thus asking you and I to do the same. In John 13, you know the passage very, very well. When he takes that towel and he wraps it around his waist at the meal there and he bends down to a basin of water and he begins to wash their feet. 
And then he says, if I being your Lord and Master do this, you go do likewise. Humility. Shelly thinks I got stock in Jack's. I really don't have stock in Jack's. As a matter of fact, I don't have stock in any fast food restaurant, although I have paid a bunch of them a lot of money. But my favorite is not Jack's. My favorite is Wendy's. I just always enjoyed Wendy's. I've always enjoyed their cleanliness. I've always enjoyed the story behind Wendy's. Maybe you know the late Dave Thomas, who had an MBA before he ever had his GED. He never graduated from high school. He wrote a book on common successes or or greatest successes for the common man. Well done. He, He never graduated from high school. And he had an MBA. Which to most people means a master's of business administration. But that's not what it means at Wendy's. It means mop, bucket, attitude. Mop, bucket, attitude. He's the only founder of any company nationwide that has ever appeared in the company's annual sales report magazine in an apron with a mop and a mop bucket. That's humility. That's what it looks like. And Whatever else he believed and whatever else he practiced, I don't know, but, but he got that one right. He understood the true meaning of servanthood, and he had his MBA. He had the proper attitude when he went to the mop bucket, and thus he instilled it in others because when Wendy's was founded, they were founded upon the principle of cleanliness. Now, maybe time and and circumstances and, and, and largeness of the company has gotten a few away from that, but that's how it was founded, upon the idea that we're going to be the cleanest fast food restaurant in the country. Thus, we're going to stay with the mop bucket. And we're going to have a good attitude about it. Humility. What does the Bible say about humility? Oh man, it's just just full, isn't it? We go back to the Old Testament. You have also given me the shield, the psalmist says, of your salvation and your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness and your condescension have made me great. God, because you Come down to my level. God, because you condescend yourself. God's ways are higher than man's ways. God's thoughts are higher than man's thoughts. God's wisdom is greater than man's... God's foolishness, rather, is greater than man's wisdom. But because God is willing to be on a level with us, because God comes down to us, because God allows Himself to be invested in us through His Spirit... It's a wonderful illustration of humility. The wise man in the Proverbs, they're just, they're just full. Proverbs 15, 33, the fear of the Lord is instruction and wisdom, and humility comes before honor. Chapter 18, before destruction, a man's heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. I, I, I can't say this is the reason it happens all the time, but... But I was amazed in life growing up at how many times I, I wanted to impress a girl. Maybe you've never been there, guys, but I was there once or twice. Have you ever noticed how in those moments of seeking to impress a girl, you fail miserably? I, I, I don't know exactly why that is. Maybe God has a purpose, right? Or, or when a buddy of mine would, would, would be trying to... You know, I had a buddy one time, he, he, could, he could literally... Bite the rim. He could literally take a hold of it with his mouth. He ripped a tooth out doing it. I almost laughed at it. You know? I mean, what do you expect, dummy? You know? I mean, you're showing out. And and isn't it often the case that, that when we're showing out, it tends to bite us, right? That's what the Proverbs say. You want to be haughty? You want to be prideful? Get ready. Humiliation might just be around the corner. And I'm not saying that God causes that all the time. Don't, don't misunderstand me like that. I'm just saying it's unique to me to, to look at it and see when, when people get too big for their britches, oftentimes life deflates them. And whether that's God working or whether it's just society or 
or whatever the case, or maybe a combination of all. It's interesting to me how loud the Bible rings true. It's just over and over. Proverbs 22 and verse 4. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. We like those three things, don't we? That's the reward for humility and fear of the Lord. In the New Testament, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 25, Jesus says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. God, I thank you that you've hidden them, you've decoded them, you've encrypted them somehow so that the wise and the understanding, they, they couldn't get it. But little children, you, you made it so simple that the smart people missed it. Why'd they miss it? Because they're too prideful. They're too haughty. Maybe making it too hard for their own good. Little children get the message. Perhaps you remember Matthew 18. Whoever humbles himself... Like this child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus brings that child and sets that child in, the, in his lap there and, and all of these people. And, and he says, okay, right here is what the kingdom of heaven looks like. Looks like a little child. Your attitude, your demeanor, your mindset, your actions, your walk needs to reveal that of a child in all humility. In the book of Luke... In Luke chapter 14 and verse 11, everyone who exalts himself will be humble. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. James 4 and verse 10, the Bible says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Passage after passage. And perhaps the most graphic story in terms of humility is found in Luke 18. Where you've got the tax collector and you've got the public. You've got the publican and you've got the sinner. You've got these two men who go up to the temple. And the Pharisee goes up and he's, he's prideful, he's haughty, he's, God, look at me. You remember the passage, I hope. Go read it again. And then he walks away. The tax collector goes up there and doesn't even lift up his eyes in all humility. Acknowledging and recognizing his sinfulness. His lowly state of being in the presence of God. And Jesus said, that man went to his house justified. The Bible's full of the importance of, of humility. Perhaps the greatest example of humility in all of the Bible is Jesus himself. As I mentioned, Philippians chapter 2, but now I go to Matthew 26, verse 39. Jesus is in the garden, and He's praying on the day, on the night before He's betrayed and arrested. And He goes a little further, and He falls on His face, and He says, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. What an awesome example of humility, being humble. Not as I will, but as you will. You see, as we sing the song, I... I have decided to follow Jesus. Jesus walked a life of humility, being humble, being lowly, being a servant. He said in Matthew 20, if anyone wants to be great in the kingdom, let him be a servant. There's a couple of examples, and I've got you in one, found in Daniel chapter 4 of humiliation. The direct opposite of humility. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm in Daniel chapter 4 and I'm in about verse 28. King Nebuchadnezzar's had his second dream and Daniel has interpreted that. In verse 28, all this came upon the king. At the end of the 12 months, he walked on the roof of the royal palace and he answered, Is this not great Babylon, which I built with my mighty power as a royal Residence for the glory of my majesty. Boy, he's elevated, isn't he? He's real high. I don't mean physically high. He is up on the roof. I don't know how high the roof was, but, but attitude-wise. Look at all this I've built for myself. All this majesty, all this 
royalty. While the words, verse 31, were still in his mouth, a voice from heaven came, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it was spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. And the, and the context goes on, and the paragraph closes out there, but that gets to the gist of it, to watch God, as Nebuchadnezzar dreamed, and as Daniel interpreted the dream, and then Nebuchadnezzar is still full of pride. He's still exalting himself. Till finally the voice comes out of heaven and says, Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're going to lose all this. You're going to go from the royal palace to the pasture. You're going to be eaten with the animals. God says, I'm going to humiliate you. You see, oftentimes when, when we get prideful and we get elevated, God says, I'm going to humiliate you it may not be as direct or as pointed or as easy to see as it is in recorded scripture but maybe looking back you and I analyze and we say yep that was God God knew I was getting too big for my britches and he and he deflated me he taught me a lesson he gave me humility by humiliating me the other one I think about is found back there in first Samuel 15 this is where Saul has been rejected and Samuel has come to him and the Lord has spoken to Samuel and he's told Samuel because Saul has rejected the Lord, he's going to take away the kingdom from him. The Lord comes to Samuel and he says in verse 10, I regret, verse 11, that I ever made King Saul king. I regret that I ever made Saul the king of Israel. God is recognizing his pride and his haughtiness God is repenting of every make of ever making him he's recanting he's he's upset with himself God is that he ever made and he's expressing that to Samuel he says okay Samuel we got to let Saul know about this so down in about verse 22 Samuel says the Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying, obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption, and presumption is iniquity and idolatry. Presumption of what? How is, how is presuming, how is pride, how is haughtiness idolatry? That's a very simple answer, right? The word humility has two eyes in it, doesn't it? And you get both of them capital. They're, they're not supposed to be capital. It's okay to have I in the picture, but it's not okay to get I elevated greater than. As a matter of fact, someone has said that the two eyes in the word humility are, are on each side of the letter L, and thus the letter L stands for love. And love ought to rise above I. I kind of like that image, if you all know the truth. Love ought to rise above the level of I. But too often, we get the eyes, as Saul had here. And he become his own idol. His idol was himself. Serving himself, doing what he wanted to. And Saul began to, to repent himself in verse 24. And I have sinned and I have transgressed. And it was too late then. From that moment forward, God sought to humiliate Saul and to take away the kingdom and to grant it to, to David. God went from that moment sparing the life of David and, and, and protecting him and guiding him and preparing him to, to take the throne. Along the way, he found Saul humiliated, running for his life. Fear of his life, about dead, scared to death, wondering what would happen next. All in an effort to humiliate him. So we have an example, one of the greatest examples of humility. And then there's a couple of examples. God knows how to do both. He understands humility and he also is able to humiliate. And we close tonight, I want to take you to a passage in Colossians chapter 2. Brother Jim read it a moment ago. He started in verse 16. This starts in... Verse 18, Colossians 2 and verse 18. 
After, after verse 16, it said, okay, now all these festivals and new moons and all that that's going on and they're promoting. Look at what he says in verse 18. Let no one disqualify you. Insisting on asceticism and worship of angels. In other words, be careful with the rituals in which you hold fast to. Because some of them are self-promoting. Some of them are, can we say, false humility. Some of them are couched in the frame of humility, but are actually prideful, haughtiness, elevated. Is it possible? Is it possible to be proud of your humility? And doesn't that kind of defeat the purpose? Are you a humble person? Yeah, I'm a humble person. Can't you tell? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, let me promote my humility to you. And thus it becomes false humility. It becomes, it becomes right the opposite of humility. It becomes pride. And, and that's what's happening here in Colossians chapter 2. They're promoting these false doctrines, among which is worship of angels. And they're going on in detail about visions. And they are puffed up. Without reason. Because their minds are sensual. They're not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together. Their joints and ligaments grow with a growth that is from God. They're not holding fast to the head because they want to be the head. As you continue in Colossians chapter 2. If with Christ you die to the elemental spirits of the world. Why? Why? As if you still are alive in the world, do you submit to these regulations? Like do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. They are all perishing as they are used. According to human precepts and teachings. The brethren in Colossae were being consumed by this human doctrine or doctrines. And this false doctrine. They were being overcome by they, these these man-made religions were being promoted. And because of that, man was becoming elevated. Our religion is better than God's religion. We've taken God's religion and we've gone a step further and made it even better. And thus, pride, haughtiness, elevation of self, man, human, a desire to serve the flesh, a desire to serve the creation rather than the creator. And then the passage ends like this in Colossians chapter 2. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom. Oh, you better be careful. You better be careful. Because they, be, they appear to be wise. In promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. But please note, Paul says, they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Colossians 2 and verse 23 makes it very clear. Our greatest danger with humility is us. It's the flesh. It's me. It's humanity. It's, it's, it's I want my way. It's I want to please myself. It's I want to be happy. It's it's, I want to do what I want to do. And, and thus the indulgence of the flesh. I can't tell myself no. I can't tell myself, you can't have that. I'm not going to tell myself that's wrong. I'll just rewrite religion so that I can justify that this is okay. That's not really what God meant. I understand what he says, but, but he really meant this. And thus, I start trying to plug myself in as the head and, and computing what I want to be the case. Instead of connecting to the head as a joint, as a ligament, as a muscle, as a bone, as a part of the body, that when it all works together, it flourishes. How can you and I do our part within the body? Well, it's, it, it all goes back to humility. It all goes back to servanthood. It all goes back to me understanding. We were talking this morning in Bible class in 1 Corinthians 4. 
It all goes back, verse 6, verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 4, they were puffed up, and thus they were causing division in the Corinthian church. God, help me. Help me to understand my place. Help me to do the best I can in my place. And help me to recognize that I am part of something much greater, much bigger than me. Boy, a family that serves together in humility is a powerful, powerful influence in our world today. Where people are seeking the betterment of other people. Because I'm telling you, where you work, where you go out to eat, where you go grocery shopping, that's not normal. People, by culture, are looking out for themselves. Humility says, I care about you. I want to help you. I want to serve you. I want to be in a family with you. This is not about me. This is about us. What's best for us? And thus that keeps me from becoming prideful and haughty and too big for my britches, puffed up, exalted. When we recognize that, folks, we're here following. We're here following. We're here following Jesus. We're here following His leadership, His authority, His guidance, His example, His footsteps, His path. Why? Because we want to go where He is. And the only way we can get there is to take the path that He took. In humility, I'm going to decide to follow Jesus. Would you do the same as we stand and sing?